Sound suppression water system now activated. STS-98, flown by Space Shuttle Atlantis, launched on February 7, 2001 from Cape Canaveral with the next module, Destiny, that was to be added to the International Space Station. Zero and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis with Destiny, a science laboratory for the 21st century. Houston now controlling. Houston Atlantis, roll program. Roger roll, Atlantis. The roll maneuver is uh, complete aboard Atlantis. The vehicle is now in a heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 201 statute mile orbit. Approaching 30 seconds into the flight, uh, preparing to uh, begin throttle down of the main engines as the vehicle prepares to pass through the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the orbiter. seconds into the flight, Atlantis is already downrange from the launch site at two and a half miles at an altitude now of five miles. Atlantis, go ahead, throttle up. Go ahead, throttle up. Atlantis's three liquid-fueled engines are back at full throttle, approaching one minute, ten seconds into the flight. All systems uh, in good shape. Uh, the hydraulic systems, auxiliary power units in excellent shape, as are the electricity producing fuel cells aboard the vehicle. Atlantis already traveling 1,500 miles per hour. Downrange from the launch site, 10 miles at an altitude of 13 miles. One minute, 30 seconds into the flight. At this point, Atlantis has already burned more than 2 million pounds of fuel and weighs half of what it did at launch. All very quiet, uh, all going very smoothly aboard the orbiter. Approaching one minute, 50 seconds. The next event is burnout and separation of the twin solid rocket boosters, which consume about 10 tons of propellant every second. SRB separation confirmed two minutes, 10 seconds into the flight. Atlanta's traveling 3,000 miles per hour. On mission day two, Atlantis approached the International Space Station and achieved docking. Actually, there's a, quite a bit of forgiveness in this. You're allowed about three inches and three degrees of uh, error uh, as you come together. And then the ring is retracted and brought down so that the two surfaces are touching each other. And then there's some very powerful hooks that emerge from the lower surface and grab a hold of the, uh, the station and pull the two vehicles together and make a hard mate. After docking, Station and shuttle crews opened hatches and unloaded supplies. Three 12-gallon bags of water, a spare computer, cables to be installed inside the station to power up Destiny, and various personal items for the station crew. On February 10, 2001, while Thomas Jones and Robert Kerbeam were on EVA in the payload bay of Atlantis, where they disconnected cables and removed protective covers from the outside hatch of Destiny, Mission Specialist Marsha Ivans used the cannon arm to grab the pressurized mating adapter 2 on Unity and maneuvered it to the Z1 truss for a temporary stay. The, uh, the part of the Z1 truss where the uh, PMA was going to go, here's Tom out here going mom back and here's the PMA on the end of the arm and here's the view from his helmet camera as he uh, gets it ready to then Ivans latched the arm onto the U.S. Destiny Laboratory in the payload bay and lifted it out. She then flipped the 16-ton lab 180 degrees and moved it into position to attach to Unity. It took about 20 minutes, 15-20 minutes to flip the lab and we can't show you that so we're going to go through it a little bit faster 
here. They put the lab in 180 degrees out, and I've been doing nothing but trying to explain why, and, you know, pick a reason. I don't know. Here it is at 90 degrees, just about 90 degrees, and the best view was what Tom and Beamer had outside. So here's the lab 90 degrees to the payload bay being shot from up on the truss. Continue to flip it around. It, it just was amazing, and uh, so the, the tourists are always taking pictures of everything. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost all the way around. And there it is, all the way around and getting ready to be put onto the node. A set of automatic bolts tightened to hold it permanently in place while Jones and Kirby began connecting power and data cables. The Destiny module is 8.5 meters long and 4.3 meters wide. It's made from aluminum and stainless steel and comprises three cylindrical section and two end cones that contain the hatch openings through which astronauts enter and exit the module. The Boeing company began construction of the 16-ton state-of-the-art research laboratory in 1995 at the McCood Assembly Facility and then at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. After it was built, Destiny was shipped to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in 1998, where it was prepared for launch and assembly to the station. On February 11, 2001, the crew entered Destiny and activated air systems, fire extinguishers, alarm systems, computers and internal communication, plus continued equipment transfers from the shuttle to the other parts of the station. They also filmed onboard scenes in the station using an IMAX camera. The next day, Jones and Kirby went outside and assisted Ivans with removing the pressurized mating adapter 2 from the Z1 trust and installing it onto the forward end of the Destiny laboratory. Once that task was complete, Jones and Kirby moved to a location on the Destiny lab and installed a power data and grapple fixture and a video signal converter to be used with the Canada Arm 2. Well, we already saw a slide of exercise, so here it is in motion, and I think we talked about how you get a lower body workout, but we haven't talked about how you work out your abs. <laughs> On February 14th, shuttle and station crews reopened hatches for transfer of equipment. The transfer was completed on February 15th, and in all, 3,000 pounds of equipment and supplies water, food, spare parts, a spare Russian carbon dioxide removal system, a spare computer, clothes, movies, and other items were moved from Atlantis to the station. In addition, about 850 pounds of trash were moved from the station back to Atlantis. Well, unfortunately, our week docked with uh, the International Space Station Alpha came to a close, and we uh, Shep rings the bell, and it's time for the Atlantis crew to leave. And it looks like I'm waiting for Shep to ring the bell. I'm actually waiting to figure out how to do this without hurting myself again. <laughs> On the 16th of February, Atlantis departed the station, and pilot Polanski flew the orbiter halfway around it before moving off and preparing for a landing that would occur on February 18th. A great view taken from uh, the station as we fire some of our uh, RCS reaction control system jets, maintaining attitude as we back away. We slowly backed away to uh, 450 feet.
And uh, here are some views. As you can see, we talked about those gold arrays up on top of P6 as we slowly maneuvered in a half a lap around the station, taking a look at our handiwork. And uh, it was really quite the thrill to get to do that. But every once in a while, I had to ask for some help because everybody was blocking my, my view through the window taking pictures. Great shot as we came over South America and the Andes here. There's the plume coming out the back as we enter the atmosphere. And gravity begins to return to the shuttle and the crew. And there's Marsha with her checklist as the flight engineer. Coming on home in the final turn, we're coming down at about 20 degrees, six times steeper than an airliner, six to seven times at about 300 knots. We're at Edwards. There's not a lot of water down here. Well, it used to be. I guess it's a dry lake bed, and there's runway 22 as we're rolling out on final. We dive down on final till we get to about 2,000 feet above the ground and then we we're aiming at a point short of the runway and when we get to 2,000 feet we start a gentle pull up. Here's a little anticipation cues telling us it's time to pull up and uh, we pull up and and get on an inner glide slope that's about a degree and a half that's about a degree and a half so that you can control very well. At about 300 feet above the ground uh, Roman lowers the landing gear don't like to put it down too early because of all the drag it causes and you don't want to put it down too late because of the drag it would cause on the runway. <laughs> and we float down the uh, runway about 2,000 feet and make a couple of landings here. And then uh, Rowan puts out the drag chute which gives a nice little tug makes you know that it's out there and then at 185 knots we lower the nose to the runway. And you'll see that the uh, the nose gear touchdown is a little more firm than the main gear. You can see the airspeed or the ground speed now on the upper left and uh, we slow down at about 60 to 70 knots we, we cut the chute away so that it doesn't damage the engine bells. Uh, this is after all a reusable spacecraft it had flown 20 something missions when we flew it and it's got many more in it and uh, you should all be very proud of the, uh, the hardware and the training and the operations that go into our space flights, we, we do a really great job here at NASA. On February 24, 2001, the expedition crew moved Soyuz TM-31 from the aft port of the Svezda to the nadir port on Zarya to make way for Progress M-44. Progress M44 was launched by a Soyuz U carrier rocket from Baikonur Cosmodrome on February 26, 2001. The spacecraft docked with the aft port of the Svesda module two days later.
Progress M44 carried supplies to the International Space Station, including food, water, and oxygen for the crew. It also carried equipment for conducting scientific research. It was the first updated Progress M spacecraft to visit the ISS. After its successful docking, the Expedition 2 crew was readied for the next shuttle flight and the installation of the Canadarm on the station.